All right. Welcome, my friends, to another episode of Extreme Health Radio. I hope you're having a great Monday wherever you are in the world, and uh, I hope you are doing great. Um, This is episode 644 with Dr. Zach Bush. We're going to introduce him in just a second. This is going to be a really fun conversation. I'm really looking uh, forward to diving more into his work. So this is going to be really, really great. Uh, For those that are new to our website or new to our podcast, we do shows twice a week on Mondays and Fridays live on YouTube and Facebook and all those other great places, as long as they'll have us, as long as they don't deplatform us. Um, So yeah, those are live at 1045 a.m. Pacific time, and this is episode 644. So if you want to grab the show notes, the links, the sponsors, anything like that that we talk about on today's show, all you have to do is remember 644. So it's extremehealthradio.com slash 644. And I, it's my birthday today, and I'm 44 years old, so it's kind of cool. <laughs> so that'll be fun to um, talk to Dr. Zach Bush. I'm really excited because I've been doing a lot of research uh, into the kind of concepts he's been talking about for a long time, and, uh, and this is going to be a great show. Uh, let me bring up some of our upcoming guests because we have a lot of cool people that we talk to um, every single week and have done so many, many great shows that it's been a lot of fun. So some of our upcoming guests, if you go to our homepage, let me bring that up really quickly. On um, Friday, we have Glenn Swartout. We're going to talk with him about accelerated self-healing. On Monday, Dr. Jacob Lieb- Lieberman will talk about light, color, and consciousness. That should be pretty fun. Uh, Callie Lyons is going to be here next Friday. Um, highly fluorinated chemicals or forever chemicals and dr michelle lamasa schrader we'll talk with her about recall healing and spiritual connection and emotional connection to disease so um, if you want to subscribe to our podcast lots of cool stuff happening so you don't want to miss anything and let me bring up uh, dr bush here first of all let, let me read his bio because he's um he's quite an accomplished guy and i want to ask him about this because he uh it says here in his bio that he's one of the few triple board certified physicians in the country with expertise in internal medicine, endocrinology, and metabolism, as well as hospice and palliative care. Uh, The breakthrough science that Dr. Bush and his colleagues have delivered offers profound new insights into our modern disease epidemics, as well as human health and longevity. So interesting. Triple board certified. Let me ask him. So, Doc, what does it mean that you're triple board certified, and why are you one of the few? Uh, that means that the American Board of uh, Medicine uh, has uh, taken me through the training and testing and certification for the areas of internal medicine, endocrinology, and hospice and palliative care, which are three different subspecialties um, outside of your medical doctorate. And so, uh, in finishing my medical doctorate at the University of Colorado, I went on to the University of Virginia and did my three years of internal medicine there, got board certified and did a chief resident year, which is a faculty teaching year there, teaching med students and residents uh, mm-hmm. in the hospital system. And then from there, went into endocrinology and metabolism, which was a three-year fellowship in studying hormone regulation of the body and deeper understanding of the intricacies of multi-organ systems and organ system diseases. My research at that point uh, developed into cancer and chemotherapy uh, uh-huh. research and development. And so I was working on vitamin A compounds that could turn on cell suicide and cancer. And I was, you know, working clinically around the area of endocrinology, which is a lot of hormone medicine like diabetes, thyroid disease, bone disease, autoimmune conditions and the like. And so that was my world. And then um, as my chemotherapeutic kind of pharmaceutical world fell apart and and its, you know, stability of that paradigm uh, was paralleled by the collapse of the economy in the United States in 2008 to 2010. Mm-hmm. And so uh, academia found itself in free fall. Uh, NIH, the National Institutes of Health, was, was losing all of its funding due to the recession. And so our department and division uh, at the University of Virginia was drying up quickly. And so there was an opportunity for me to jump to a different paradigm, which was to start my own small clinic in rural Virginia and was most impoverished areas of the state and Mm -hmm. started a nutrition center for reversing chronic disease there. And so during that time, went into my uh, third subspecialty training while I was running my clinic uh, in hospice and palliative care, which is end of life and pain management uh, kind of specialty of medicine and and board certified in that as well. So in the end, it meant a long path and lots of uh, (laughs) nonlinear developments and 
uh, the universe was slapping me around a good fair amount and uh, found myself where I am today. That's so that's so interesting. And so uh, when you were talking a little bit about the vitamin A compounds um, causing cell apoptosis, uh, the first question that sort of comes to mind, are you talking about like more uh, beta carotene or retinoic acid um, vitamin A from animal products? Is there a difference there in what you were looking at? Yeah, they can both do it. And so I was using the retinoids because they were yeah, had already been patented by a pharmaceutical company. And so it was easy for me to dive into that. A usage, but you can get the same effect out of a, a beta carotene as well. That's interesting. And so, what was it doing? Was it showing a lot of promise in terms of um, apoptosis with cancer cells? Yeah, it was exciting. We were starting to realize that we didn't have to poison cancer to to get it to die, and we realized, you know, with that research, along with many others at the time, as we as this concept of apoptosis was really emerging, we were starting to realize that cellular communication was being dictated largely by these mitochondria that live inside of our cells and that information stream coming out of the mitochondria was exactly what was capable of recognizing the situation of a cancer cell or a situation where there's so much damage that the the cell could neither uh, safely uh, kill itself or replicate uh, it lost those mechanisms. And so to find out that the mitochondria, which are these little organisms that live inside the human cells, and they're non-human in that they have their own DNA. They look more like a bacteria, but their DNA is more like a virus. Mm-hmm. And so they have this weird microbial kind of morphology in both their physical structure as well as their <laughs> genomics. Mm-hmm. And they were dictating, you know, the survival or death of that cell and therefore, ultimately, you know, the survival or death of a patient, which was such an intriguing shift in mentality that maybe the damaged human cell was a, a part of the symptomology of a chronic situation rather than the disease itself. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, that pathway was really paradigm shifting for me, really opened up my the blinders that perhaps biology was much more diverse in its methodology and approach to creating a thrive state in the human cell, the idea that it might take mitochondria and bacteria and fungi, that those seeds started to get planted at that, that time point. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm guessing that you, I think you said you were using um, a, a patentable form of vitamin A. Um, when you were using that and seeing cells go through apoptosis, cancer cells, um, were you... You know, um, was your first thought that this is a patentable form of vitamin A and this is not ne- something necessarily natural? And so it, your mind didn't go to the idea that natural can cause apoptosis and start looking down that rabbit trail? Yeah, that's exactly what happened to me. You know, it took me from this pharmaceutical mindset to the possibility that nutrition could, could be a powerful tool for preventing or treating cancer. And uh, that would ultimately lead to my departure to to the nutrition environment in 2010, but leading up to that, I further had the realization that there had never been a cancer cell in history or a human cancer condition in history that had been caused by a lack of chemotherapy. Hmm. And so that fundamental realization led to that paradigm shift where you realize I could spend the rest of my career for another 40 years chasing the wind with these chemotherapies and pharmaceutical tools and blah, blah, blah. But in the, in the end, I'm way down the path of, of symptom management and nowhere near a root cause solution mm-hmm. to this dilemma. And there's no way that I, I'm going to fix the problem if I'm not at the root cause of that problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. So many people get into natural health. Um, I got into it. My mom was diagnosed with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma back in 95 and uh, the doctors gave her a 10% chance of living and uh, she went ended up going to the city of hope uh, here in California and did the whole chemotherapy radiation surgery uh, bone marrow transplant all of that and I just I saw her age like so quickly and I just saw her body breaking down so fast um, that I just thought to myself there has to be a better way I mean it seemed to be it seemed to work and oddly enough, I'm, I'm shocked myself. She's now 78 years old and she's still alive and she's doing relatively well, having gone through all that. But my God, I mean, with cancer rates, like you mentioned in some of your other podcasts, I mean, they're skyrocketing. One in two women now and one in three or one in two men it used to be one in three, one in two before 1960. Now it's 50% across the board. It's just like, man, this is the, this is the disease of our, of our time, isn't it? 
Yeah, we've doubled our rates of cancer just in the last 25 years, and the most heavily affected in some way has been our children. I was recently down at MD Anderson, uh, Texas University Children's Hospital, and uh, it's devastating to see these massive towers. Uh, you know, it's basically a city that's been built as a hospital down there in Houston uh, uh-huh. for our our cancer-ridden children. It's it's just uh, unbelievable that we've gotten to this stage without some public outcry and some fundamental shift in our regulatory and bureaucratic. You know, healthcare system that we would allow our children to be this affected by a disease epidemic, mm-hmm. and even today, I don't hear any clamoring. I don't see hear any clamoring in any of the the presidential debates. I don't hear any clamoring at the CDC. Nobody's clamoring for you know solutions to this epidemic, and instead, they keep pouring you know more and more money into the pharmaceutical pathways. When we know fundamentally as scientists, physicians, and just as consumers that that is just not a root cause solution, and it's certainly not going to prevent the disease. You know, we can debate whether chemotherapy is at all effective for cancer, or is it actually you know, the nutritional shifts that happen during chemotherapy that actually cures you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so your mother's situation has been chalked up many times to the success of chemotherapy. Mm-hmm. But if we really look at the, the physiology there, we, we could uncover that we're nowhere near honest about that. Like the the nutritional impact of, of getting somebody that sick is how that cancer can can then go into an ap- apoptotic or you know complete cell death state. Mm-hmm. Whereas the the poison that we're giving as a chemo, we can never give it at a high enough dose to actually kill all the cells. Mm-hmm. We can slow down the replication of these cells. We can disrupt their genomics and, and take advantage of their impaired repair systems, but you can never give somebody enough chemotherapy to cure them. It's too much toxin, and so you can, you're just hoping to knock the tumor down enough, slow its growth down long enough that the body figures out how to get back on top of that cancer process, mm-hmm. and that's what happened to your mother. She, her body had the, had an opportunity as the tumor was knocked back to, to catch up and do something profoundly different with the mm-hmm. biology. And a lot of that had, to, I believe, to do with the patterns of, of lack of food intake, the, the kind of forced starvation that happens with chemotherapy when we make you that sick, that you're nausea and vomiting and mm-hmm. losing weight and shut down your metabolic pathways. We send you into a severe fasting state, mm-hmm. and we now know that fasting is one of the most powerful ways to kill cancer cells. And so I have an emerging belief system that much of our chemotherapy works simply by making somebody sick enough that they stop eating. And once they stop eating, their body <laughs> and the tumor go through a natural healing process. Wow, that's incredible. That's so incredible. Um, now, we've had a lot of guests on the, on the show talk about um, cancer stem cells versus actual tumor cells and the difference between the two. And, um, and, and what you're saying, too, to their point, it makes a lot of sense in that the chemotherapy doesn't actually kill uh, the cancer cells all the way. I mean, it does, but not, you know, at the highest dosage that, that you would require. Um, and we've had certain guests too mention that chemotherapy and radiation actually anger the cancer stem cells. Not only does it not kill the stem cell cancers, but it actually, it angers them. It might shrink a tumor, sort of the outer cells of a, of a hard tumor or something, but it's actually angering the stem cells. Have you found that to be true? Do you think that's true? Yeah, I actually have seen that. I've tracked that in my own patients. Um, my patients, when they're going through nutrition therapy, we will often follow circulating tumor cells in their bloodstream. Mm-hmm. So instead of doing a bunch of MRIs, I'll, I'll let the oncology team do that, and I'll just follow circulating tumor cell counts. And that's the way I can keep tabs on the behavior of the cancer. All they're looking at on MRI and CT scans is the gross size of the tumor and they're, sum- they're surmising or, or presuming the outcome based on that primary tumor, when in fact we know that primary tumors very rarely cause any harm or death to the, to the patient. It's always the metastatic uh, disease that leads to the metabolic collapse of the, the organism that would lead to its death from cancer. And so to map that, we follow circulating tumor cells. And over and over again, as somebody starts chemotherapy, you can see those circulating tumor cells go up which is radically wrong direction. As soon as the circulating tumor cells go above five, uh, five tumor cells per seven and a half milliliters of blood, as soon as you exceed that number, the chance of them having subsequent metastatic 
you know, disease and, and death goes way up. And I've seen people go from undetectable levels of circulating tumor cells going into chemotherapy to levels of 35, 40 in their circulating tumor cells during chemo. After they get off of the chemotherapy, we can do all the anti-inflammatory work and nutritional work and all that, and we can get those tumor cells to go back down. But unfortunately, you know, you fast forward a few months or a couple of years, and suddenly that person is you know, dying of metastatic disease years out because of the seeding that happened, presumably during chemotherapy, when we could see all those live cancer cells in their bloodstream. That's crazy. I never really thought about that because I've heard other doctors talk about the dangers of doing like a biopsy and putting a needle physically into a tumor and then some of those uh, microscopic cancer cells will actually be extracted and start circulating in the, in the blood and actually spread cancer as a result of the biopsy. Um, and you never hear much talk in the medical world about how biopsies are dangerous in that regard. Um, maybe you do, but I never really heard that about chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is almost kind of doing the same thing in terms of spreading cancers? Yeah, it certainly can. I mean, it's certainly not across the board that you're going to see that CTC jump. It's going to depend on what kind of cancer. Um, I've seen that most ha happen in breast cancer, and that actually follows very closely with the, the clinical history of breast cancer. Breast cancer is one of the classic ones that we continue to report. Yay, we got a great result. You know, you got a radiologic cure, and then five years later, suddenly it's all over the body. Um, 17 years later, we've seen a recurrence of breast cancer 35 years later with the same tumor, you know, cells genomically. And so uh, for that, you know, those, it, whether it's a stem cell that's doing all that work, or I think it's also likely that these cells are setting up, you know, after seeding in the bloodstream, they find little pockets of, of biology to start to, to get a foothold. And over the years, they have adaptive, you know, techniques that to allow them to start to thrive to the point where they can then kind of go into a, a more aggressive clinical manifestation. Mm -hmm. after you know, years or decades of being quiet. So I think all of that is you know, definitely well documented in the literature. Um, it doesn't mean that chemotherapy is bad for that reason. Chemotherapy you know, has some track records with some cancers. And so um, you know, Hodgkin's lymphoma is a good example where there seems to be a high degree of long-term survival after chemotherapy for Hodgkin's. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, not quite as good of a track record, and we tend to see secondary cancers in a lot of those patients that have long-term survival. And if you read the, the warnings on any chemotherapy, cancer is one of the side effects of chemotherapy mm -hmm. because we, could, we know we're doing so much genomic injury uh, to the, all of the, the non-cancer cells in the, in the body when you expose to something like chemo, especially mm -hmm. if you're doing you know, cocktails of chemotherapies you're getting such you know vast disruptions of methylation patterns and all kinds of you know very important precancerous changes are happening in those cells and so you can set the patient up for secondary cancer mm, and yeah. so unfortunately you know there's no right answer right now like is chemotherapy right well no not as a, a stopgap but is it wrong well no because it's there's nothing else there as a tool for that moment to so we're stuck in this no man's land between, mm -hmm. you know, right and wrong right now. And, and so for me and my clinic, it really comes down to teaching my patients intuition and mm -hmm. listening to their bodies and, frankly, their soul level communication to say, what are you here to do? What, what, why are you here on earth and are you doing it right now? And what's, what is the, the medical philosophy that would most align with that deep sense of self mm -hmm. in you? And for a lot of patients, that's, I'm never doing chemotherapy. And for a lot of patients, that's like, yeah, if I need to do chemotherapy, I'll do that, understanding that I also need to do nutrition and exercise and total transformation of my, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thought process or whatever it is, and they're willing to do all that work. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of consumers that are like, oh, I'm just going to sign up at, at MD Anderson or Sloan Kettering, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry, and they're doing research all the time. And so I'm at the cutting edge with just chemo, surgery, and radiation. And I feel very peaceful there. So mm -hmm. I, I completely accept all three of those avenues. I think that it, uh, we're, we're in a gray zone now. It is my hope and expectation that in 20 to 30 years, we're going to look back at this last kind of 30, 40 year journey of the chemotherapy era with, you know, shuddering to realize that was the extent of our belief system or our ingenuity as a medical community at the time. Mm -hmm. I think we have far more creative capacity. I think we have far more 
opportunity to do transformative and, and health supportive approaches. Mm-hmm. We're with Dr. Zach Bush. His website is ZachBushMD.com, and this is episode 644, so we'll put all the links there. Um, you know, Doc, it's, it's interesting that you said what you said about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, because my mom, that's what her body had in 1995, so that was almost 25 years ago. And the fact that she's still alive, um, it's, it's interesting, because here I am in the alternative health space, Championing, championing the um, efforts of natural medicine. Meanwhile, I should be waving the flag of how great chemotherapy is. But I think my what my mission is is just, is just like you. It's I don't necessarily want to tell people what to do, but I just want to make sure that people have all the options that are available to them and not think that there's only one way to heal. You know, that's a big big deal. I think. Yeah, and I, I have a feeling your mother's been on a long journey that has, you know, been transformative after chemotherapy. And uh, I'd be interested to hear from you kind of what are the observations you've made in her life span now over those 25 years since chemotherapy? Is she the same woman she was before that cancer journey? And how has she changed both in lifestyle as well as maybe even her sense of self? Yeah, it's it's interesting because it is most definitely a wake up call for everybody. Um, you know, when it comes down to this, and she's a completely different person. Um, we're still working with her on a lot of different detoxes and different things that she can do, and uh, in, in helping her get healthier and healthier. But to your point earlier, in terms of non Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, she has. It's interesting because you said in non Hodgkin's lymphoma, there's a typically um, a rise in secondary cancers as a result four patients that are um, still alive, you know, many, many years later. And that's exactly what happened to her. So she's had secondary cancers of the, I think, uh, recently of the breast and then of the lungs and I think somewhere else. Um, but it's it's every single time she goes through this, it's like a, a soul awakening journey. And I think that's cancer's sort of message to us, right, is get us back on track and realize what am I doing here? Like you said with your patients, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Yeah, you're spot on. And and her journey sounds like one I've heard, seen many times now, which is um, if you don't find your way to the root of the problem, which is uh, fundamentally in cancer, one of loneliness. And so if you don't find your, your way all the way to the root of why there's cellular loneliness happening in your body, then there's going to be another cancer to come along. And cancer will keep coming until we completely reconnect. And we can look at that at the patient level and, and prove that out. And we can look at that at the societal level and get excited about what does that mean for us now that we're in an epidemic of cancer. Like you said, one in two males, one in three females going to get cancer before they die now in the United States. At those rates of cancer, what are we? what is our species journey now? What is that telling us about where we're at? And it's screaming to me that we have to stop acting as if we are isolated beings and we need to start really integrating our psychology, our spirituality, our physiology with the idea of singularity. We are at one with nature. We are certainly at one with the rest of our species and it is only going to be through the final breaking down of the, the false walls that we've put up between one another and really reconnect at a deep spiritual consciousness level that we might see the end of this cancer epidemic. And I believe that that cancer epidemic will be a huge part of the extinction of our species over the next you know, seven to 10 decades, which is the current rate that we're heading for if we don't change. And, and I'm very okay with that as well. As a hospice physician, I see the dying process as a beautiful transformation that happens in my patients over and over again. And um, one of the most privileged things I can do as a human being is be alongside a dying patient and watch their rebirth happen and let, watch them drop the shackles of their ideals and their roles and their belief system to really come face to face with whatever it is on the other side of this physical veil. And as they do that, I watch them transform. And so now we imagine the hospice chapter for our species that we're now in. And when we get that terminal diagnosis that you, you can no longer escape extinction and you're heading towards that, I believe we can escape it at the moment, but there will be a, a terminal 
diagnosis at some point in these next decades if we aren't transformed. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I think we could see a massive shift in consciousness, just as I see an individual patient. And if that's the journey we need to reach a moment of singularity and a moment of true connectivity, so be it. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful death in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as we're not too drugged up to experience it. And that gets yeah. me a little concerned. The opiate you know, addiction yeah. problem we have in this country right now mm -hmm. is being really f foisted upon us by physicians uh, in their altruistic effort to relieve pain. And it's the hospice doctor who most worries me that if we are drugging our patients to the point of stupor at the end of their life, what's their chance of, of consciousness shift? What's their chance of passing on information from that thin veil to those of us left behind? Mm -hmm. What's the chance that we're going to learn what we must learn in that second rebirth if we've got them all drugged uh, up so much that they're, they're, I suppose, comfortable? They're certainly numbed up on, on the bed, mm -hmm. but they're not interacting with their loved ones. They're not saying that, that pearl of wisdom that they would have otherwise at the bedside as they die. And so that concerns me that physicians are starting to act in such a way that not only may we go extinct, we might go extinct in a stupor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so, so interesting. I'm Kind of a couple of things on what you said I found super interesting was this idea of learning, you know, um, during that transition process and whatever, whatever life lessons um, you're supposed to learn and grow into. If we can take that moment and bring it down, let's say you're 90, 100 years old when that happens, if you can take the lessons learned in that final moment and apply them to someone who's 30, 40, 50 years old, maybe that process doesn't have to happen if you're able to sort of learn those lessons preemptively. Um, I thought that was interesting. And then also, what you talked about, connection, I, I think, I wonder if like, you know how they talk about in science and physics, the macro uh, and the micro, and the, diff and the micro is an effect on the macro and vice versa. And I'm wondering about connection because I talk about this a lot that we're disconnected from each other you know we're like like in our cell phones and texting all this we're disconnected through technology we're disconnected from the earth through, from nature you talk a lot about that in the microbiome we're disconnected from our who we are our mission we're disconnected from source from God whatever that is for people yeah. we're disconnected on so many levels and I wonder if our cells are mimicking that and, and disconnecting themselves as well from a general microbiome and ecosystem that's supposed to be connecting to each other. And I wonder if that's the reason certain cells go off and become rogue and it's mimicking the macro, which to the cell is just our body and our life. I wonder if there's a connection there. You're 100% right. I, there's no wonder left in me. I, I know that's the case. Yeah. And perhaps even more profound is uh, it actually goes the other direction, too. And so if you, if you take a toxin into your body that, that breaks the connections between the human cells, you create cancer there as well. And so you can do it through an, an emotional trauma that isolates you from humanity, isolates you from your family, makes you feel victimized in some way. Um, the maternal meridian runs from the tip of the big toe, you know, up the back of the leg, up, up through the groin line, through the kidney, up through the human breast, you know, up into the end of the mouth, up to the first molar. This massive electrical line crosses every gynecologic cancer, the uterus, the ovary, the breast, even the thyroid, you know, and so this maternal line of stress when we traumatize women when we traumatize generation after generation of women um, we know that those emotional traumas get stored in that meridian and as that meridian becomes more and more chaotic with those stored traumas we see cancers develop in that space in the same way when tumors go metastatic those metastatic cells always find the weakest, darkest, most damaged parts of the body to set up shop. Those ones most disconnected from the, the natural healing, you know, regenerative nature of biology. The tumors will always find those dark pockets of, of trauma and uh, loneliness within the body. And so we can do it from the macro down to the micro, or we can put glyphosate or Roundup into our food, which breaks all of those you know, fiber optic cables between our cells 
and suddenly creates, yes, leaky gut, yes, leaky brain, leaky kidneys, but more profoundly, it creates isolation by breaking those ties. And mm -hmm. so in that isolation, you'll get cancer as well. And so whether your avenues through the macro trauma or through the micro trauma, the end point is a lonely cell and cancer. That's so, so interesting. We're with Dr. Zach Bush and his website is ZachBushMD.com. If you guys are interested in checking out his work, which I highly suggest you do, you can do that. Uh, and this is episode 644. And I wanted to tell you guys about, uh, take a little break here, about one of our, our products that we use and I use every single day. And that is uh, a Relax Far Infrared Sauna. And you talk about sauna therapy and how important it is to detoxify our cells, our cells are, our fat cells, um, happen to be a place where toxins in our chemicals uh, and toxins and poisons in our environment, uh, store, you know, store up. And this is where they, they live. They also live in the lymph fluid and everywhere else in the body as well. But one of the great things about a sauna is it actually helps to, through far infrared light, to oscillate these fat cells and allow these toxins to be excreted through the skin. And this is something that um, I, I do every single day uh, is a relaxed far infrared sauna session. And listen to what Dr. Robert Rowan had to say about sauna therapy. It's one of the biggest. The other issue is the chemicals in the environment. And mm. to get rid of chemicals in the environment, probably the most cost-effective method is to sweat them out. And bar infrared saunas is going to help sweat them out. Uh -huh. I mean, look at the breast. What is the breast? It's 90% fat. It's only 10% mammary tissue. Mm -hmm. So the fat of the breast is going to store all these poisons, which act as estrogens, and hold it right up against sensitive mammary tissue. And so these toxins get stored in the fat cells, and you can sweat these things out. It's been shown that when you sweat in, like, far infrared saunas, you actually can begin downloading toxins from your body. Yeah, guys. So this is something I think is really important with 60,000 new chemicals introduced into our environment since the early 1960s. 84,000 chemicals are in commerce at any given moment. We have chemicals coming at us from everywhere. And um, we're going to talk about the, the microbiome and glyphosate and digestion, how that connects to all of disease as well. But we had Stephanie Seneff on some time ago talking about how glyphosate is now uh, found through ethanol and 10% of of, uh, of corn being GMO sprayed. Uh, now we're breathing this stuff in our air. And so th these chemicals are ubiquitous. They're everywhere in our environment. And, um, you know, if you're not on a strategy to eliminate these toxins in multiple different ways and multiple different forms, um, you know, you're storing these things, you become the filter. And so, uh, this is my favorite sauna. We sell other ones as well, but this is the one that I use. And, um, this is just a great portable sauna. It, it heats up immediately. You don't have to preheat it. You don't have to knock down any walls. Uh, you can sit in it with your head out. And I like to watch documentaries and, um, you know, Netflix and whatever else in there to make the time go by. And it's just a, tr it's just a great product. And I highly encourage you guys to consider turning your home into a, um, kind of a healing sanctuary, you know, a place where you can do some of these self-care practices that will help extend your life and make you more healthy too. And um, something else too that I wanted to show you and something that I do in tandem with the sauna is uh, jumping up and down on a rebounder. Now, I used to think that jumping up and down, like this was like 1975, the year I was born, Farrah Fawcett, jumping up and down in those, you know, workout uniforms. And it was just so 1970s, you know. But once I started learning about rebounding and what it does to your lymph system and how it opens in um, these one-way valves that are all throughout your body that there's no pump like there is for a heart for the lymph system. Many argue the heart is not a pump and that's that's true too, but there's no real pump for the lymphatic system and jumping up and down using that negative and positive G-force energy at the bottom of the bounce helps to open up um, those lymphatic system drainage tubules and get rid of the stuff from your body. And listen to what um, a really cool guest we had on, Dr. Judy Mikovit said about um, jumping up and down on a rebound. And let's think about the simplest thing. I used to do one of those rebounders for uh -huh. exercise back <laughs> in the 80s and things like that. And that's it's a wonderful way to move your lymphatics because a lot of these toxins simply clog up the highways. Think about L.A., that's why I take the train, because you can't get there from here. There's so much road construction narrowing down to three lanes here and there. That blocks it all up. That's with the lymphatics. That's with the blood. You know, that's why we see all this swelling and, and inflammation. It's And then all of these toxins are talking to the cells that say, I have to go repair. And overdoing repair causes cancers, because you need to turn that off. 
Now, we can't say that the Bellicon rebounder that we have here on biocharge.me or the saunas or anything like that, we can't make medical claims and say these things cure anything at all. But to me, they're just tools that we can start adding into our, our life um, to prevent diseases and, and things like this. And so self-care is a really, really powerful thing. And I think it's really important for all of us to start getting into um, some daily practices that you can do. And what's cool about the Bellicon, um, if you're interested, is is that it has these foldable legs. So you can store it underneath your bed. Um, it, they come in all the, these different shapes and sizes. And there's bars if you're concerned about balance. And um, I do mine outside. And, um, and and I listen to podcasts. And I get the full spectrum sunlight and breathe fresh air. And uh, it's just a great, great thing. I like to do it after I work out. So I, I love working out and surfing and hiking and all kinds of things like this. But when, when I'm done... I'll jump up and down and just flush all of this um, lactic acid from my workouts and toxins in my lymphatic system. I'll flush all that, and then I'll go sit in a sauna. So, um, I, you know, these things don't cure anything, but they accelerate the process, I think, of getting healthier. And I'm really a big fan of bringing these things into your life as a daily or just maybe even a weekly practice. So if you're interested in the uh, Bellicon Rebounder or the Relax Far Infrared Sauna, um, go to biocharge.me or this is episode 644 uh, and that is extremehealthradio.com forward slash 644 and you can um, get access to them there and we'll be right back with Dr. Bush and if you guys have any questions in the chat room on our YouTube page, we'll take questions there because I can't manage <laughs> like Facebook and YouTube and all these different places. So we'll just stick with YouTube for, uh, for now for questions. Uh, and if you want to call, um, our Skype should be connected. So if you have any questions for Dr. Bush, uh, you can call our Skype handle is Extreme Health Radio. So we'll be right back right after this. You're listening to Extreme Health Radio, and I hope you're enjoying this show. Please share it with your friends by tagging at Extreme Health Radio on Instagram. Stay tuned for new shows weekly. Yeah, if you guys are watching on the video, that was a really cool story of an Italian guy who had was diagnosed with cancer that I shared on our Instagram. Uh, and the story behind him and his cancer is just fascinating because he, he actually ended up going um, back to Italy, starting a, <laughs> he started a wine business and built a vineyard and started growing um, grapes to, to, to harvest wine. Uh, and then 50 years goes by and he goes back to New York to visit his oncologist to tell them that he never did die. And all of his, onco- all of his oncologists were dead. And so he outlived all of his doctors, uh, you know, for 50 years of the same guys who were telling him that, uh, that he was going to die of cancer. It's just an amazing story. So anyway, that was just a little post on our Instagram feed if you guys are uh, interested in following us on there. Um, as long as we have that platform and as long as we're able to, to sort of be on there and share stuff, um, it would be great to have you on. So Dr. Bush, I'm curious about sort of what we're kind of hinted at a little bit. You mentioned glyphosate. And, um, and that, and the role of that, um, do you think, I think you've mentioned this yourself too in past interviews. Do you think Stephanie Seneff was accurate in, in the connection there between glyphos- glyphosate sprayed corn, 10% of ethanol being in gasoline and us breathing this stuff in our environment? Do you think that's true? Oh, uh, yeah. It's showing up about 75% of our air and about 75% of our rainfall now. I think that the ethanol is only one of the many avenues that it has in there. Um, my sense is that the vast majority that ends up in our air is not from the burning of ethanol in our gas tanks. It's actually from the uh, evaporation of, of contaminated water from our agricultural systems. The highest cancer rates in the entire country has changed radically over the last 30 years. Uh, before the advent of GMO crops in 1996 and back in time, uh, we had the highest rates of cancer death in the Northeast and the Northwest and never in the South. And then suddenly with the debut of Roundup Ready crops, when we started adding uh, Roundup as a routine you know, crop treatment throughout the growing season, at massive doses compared to where it was before 1996 uh, because we could suddenly spray the crops directly instead of just spot spraying the weeds. And with that advent of, you know, the massive spraying, we see this reversal of the cancer maps in the United States where suddenly all the highest cancer rates are in the deep south at the end of the Mississippi River the last 90 miles 
being the most severe version of that, that, that death, uh, that uh, cancer alley, as it's now referred to as those highest rates of cancer death. That's the last 90 miles between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, Louisiana. And that's new. That was as of 2007, you know, forward. That's kind of our, our death map. And so it's a really interesting thing that, again, the CDC and our government bodies haven't, you know, rung the bell on this alarming fact that we cause some sort of massive economic, uh, environmental damage down in the South in a short 10 year period that would then go on to such a dramatic public health shift. And um, so that's, those are maps from the CDC. You can pull them up from the cdc.gov website, uh, cancer uh, epidemiology pet maps for the U.S. Uh, 1996 and before, and then 2007 to 2011 are the maps that they, they have readily available there. Um, and yet, you know, we, we find that this glyphosate molecule is water soluble. And so as we spray these crops with Roundup, and glyphosate uh, compounds, glyphosate is the active ingredient within Roundup that does a lot of the damage. And uh, our laboratory for the last seven years has been working on the mechanisms by which Roundup destroys gut membranes, blood brain barrier, and causes that cell isolation. And in that study, we realized, you know, that the main connection between the toxin and the injury is not just the direct damage, but the intervening one, which is the, the damage to the microbiome. And so the ecosystem, vast in its biodiversity, you know, 5 million species of fungi on planet Earth, 300,000 species of parasites, 40,000 species of, of bacteria. And then we get to the viruses, and we're at 10 to the 31 viruses, one with 31 zeros after it. It's more viruses than we can wrap our head around. And so we're steeped in this biologic life. And now as we you know, kind of dissect out how come chronic epidemic of disease uh, in so many different organ systems, kidney failure, number one, worldwide, number two, cardiovascular disease, number three, cancer, number four, you know, neurologic stuff with uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, autism, attention deficit, that whole gamut went vertical and its disease patterns at the same point in human history. And so you have to, you know, come to terms with the fact that we did some catastrophic widespread injury. And I would definitely agree with Stephanie Seneff that that is number one roundup. We, we did that more than anything else between 1996 and 2007. So even though someone may not be consuming foods that they at least think because it's um, you know certified organic, at least they they think that's the case. But even though someone doesn't eat actively uh, food that's sprayed, they're still getting this in their water, right? Um, in their in their soils, in the rain, and in the air. So there's there's no, it's ubiquitous, right? It's, it's like there's no getting around it. Yeah, there's no getting around it now. It's a water-soluble molecule on uh, on a water-soluble planet. You know, biology is water-based on this planet, so we have really gotten that chemical into everything. And certainly, organic food has less, you know, glyphosate and Roundup in it in most cases, but it's it's certainly detectable in a lot of uh, organic foods out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, organic baby foods right now are testing really high in heavy metals and glyphosate and such. So um, it's very very difficult to get clean food. Mm. When we've done this level of damage, you know, to put it in perspective, we're spraying four billion pounds of this chemical into the soils and water systems of the planet every year now, and so that that just you know it's very hard to wrap your own head around what a hundred thousand pounds would look like, but four billion pounds Jeez. of a single chemical. Yeah, that's so crazy. So many chemicals. Wow. So when this glyphosate is getting into our bodies, specifically our microbiome and our gut. Um, I'm curious, what is it doing there? Like what happens as a result of it? But then I think what a lot of people don't think about too is that we don't just have a microbiome in our gut. Like every organ has its own pH, has its own microbiome with its own organisms on top of our skin. So it's not like it's just in the gut. But what is it doing when it enters the body, do you think? Yeah, it functions as an antimicrobial, and so it's, it's been patented as an antibiotic, antiparasite, uh, antifungal. It it's, does a lot of damage to the microbiome on a lot of levels. And Monsanto, when it rolled out those initial patents for the chemical, showed us the pathway by which it would function as an antibiotic, and it, it is through something called the shikimate pathway. 
the shikimate pathway is an enzyme pathway that bacteria, fungi, and plants have, but humans and other eukaryotic multicellular organisms like cattle and your pets, all of us large mammals don't have these these pathways of the shikimate uh, enzyme system. And the shikimate enzyme system makes aromatic amino acids, these critical amino acids that are the building blocks for the human proteins and proteins for any you know, life on Earth. By blocking the shikimate pathway, it functions as a weed killer. The plant can no longer make the essential amino acids needed for its protein structure, so the weed d- dies in a couple of days. In the same way you spray the soils, earthworms, bacteria, fungi, they all die very quickly. We can wipe out anywhere between 50% and 100% of earthworms with a single application of Roundup across a farm. And so it's a, a devastating reality that we're killing macro and micro life with this compound. As you very well described there, the human body is an organic garden. We now know that the human breast, the prostate, the brain even, is teeming with life. And when we accumulate injury, the microbiome is there to respond in a supportive fashion. And so it's so much so much shocking to find out that uh, a breast that's been damaged from that macro environment that we first described where emotional trauma and suppression of women and abuse of women over generations can cause an accumulation of, of stress in a single pathway, which epigenetically then gets passed down from one woman to the next. And then you're, you're distilling down or you're concentrating this you know, trauma that's predisposing for dysfunction in, the, in that meridian, like the breast. And at the moment that that breast tumor starts to emerge, the pH is off, the, uh, the osmolality, all these you know, biologic um, kind of markers of the terrain of the breast are all off. Mm-hmm. And what happens in those moments and, and probably in the weeks and months before that cancer develops is the microbiome has shifted and the typical bacteria in the breast get out of the way and you have methylobacterium as the primary and with a few other species in backup to try to detox the breast, try to re- restore some sort of metabolic function in this damaged space and the rest. So I find it very compelling that not only is there microbiome in all of these organ systems, when we find injury that we can't repair at the human cell level, the microbiome responds. The area in the brain that is responsible for Alzheimer's dementia If you stain those sections of the brain for fungi after death in in a post-mortem analysis, we find that Candida glabrata, a very, very common uh, fungus that can also function as a yeast, um, that Candida glabrata transforms into the mycelial form rather than the yeast form and builds a mycelial network around the damaged neuron of the woman's brain seemingly in an effort to get nutrients back into this space, which is exactly what the mycelium does in soil. When we damage soil and and kill the microbial, kind of bacterial microbial life there, the fungi show up stronger to bring in the mycelial uh, delivery system to bring nutrients from far off places to do the cell repair, as well as the terrain repair uh, after that injury. And so to find out that the microbiome within the human has the same adaptive and kind of emergency response system is truly miraculous and beautiful. It's amazing. So amazing how intricate and complex our bodies are. Like we just, we have no, I feel like we know so much, but yet so little at the same time. Um, We had a guest on, really interesting uh, Dr. Amy Prohl, P-R-O-A-L, and she was talking about some studies that she's been doing or she's been uh, reading about. And I think uh, San Diego, and she was talking about how like viruses and, and bacteria and things will um, learn together. They'll turn off cell receptors. They'll build biofilms. And there, she was saying that now uh, in University of San Diego, they're showing now that these uh, viruses that are living in biofilms or whatever they're doing in the body, uh, they're harnessing, piggybacking off your nervous system, and they're communicating with other cells or viruses in other parts of your body through your nervous system. So they're hijacking your nervous system and communicating in some way. All this is happening. We, we have no idea like what's, what's going on. You know, We just have no idea. It's crazy. I agree, and I don't think it's necessarily a hijacking. I think that our brains and nervous systems, peripheral and central and both, um, really developed with a direct communication to the microbiome uh, from the very beginning. 
Wow. Uh, we now know that the ion channel in the surface of bacteria is identical to the ion channel in the surface of a peripheral nerve in the way that it sniffs out information from the, from the periphery. And furthermore, UC San Diego, as you mentioned, as well as UCSF, have done a lot of recent work on that gut uh, interplay with the neurons. And what they're showing is that the, the afferent nerves within the gut lining are actually extending past the boundary of our gut to actually interact interact directly with the microbiome milieu in the gut lining, which is just dumbfounding. It, we always assumed that the brain and the peripheral nerves were like this holy of holies that had to be, you know, multiple times separated from the outside world just to keep it safe. To mm -hmm. find out these nerves are intentionally reaching past the the safety of the human, you know, organism to interact directly with these microbes makes me believe that we in fact developed with the soils of the planet. We developed with the soils within our human gut such that we would design our neural system to listen. We now know that the skin uh, nerves are interacting through the same ion channels with the microflora uh, my, of, the, of the skin. And so it's not at all surprising that when you get a gut screw up and things are inflamed and you have leaky gut and inflammation in the sm first small intestine, you end up with eczema and very specific uh, patches of the skin inflamed and dumping toxin. And so in this way, the nervous system of the gut creates, you know, not only a neural path, but also an endocrine path, a paracrine path, a lymph lymphatic path, a pathway for detoxification back to the skin in a very specific fashion and such that if this section of the small intestine is affected, this part of the skin erupts. This part of the here of the small intestine is affected. This part of the skin erupts, and so it's just this very fascinating interplay by between the organic garden, the microbes of your gut, interacting directly with the, the afferent nerves within the intestines, going back to communicate with brain, brain putting back information out to the skin, skin interacting directly with the microbiome of the uh, the nervous system there. So. It's just an intricate web of information. And so I think that at this point, I see three different brains. The first probably being our gut, the second being our skin, and the third one, this gray matter in our head. Uh, the, this gray matter up in our brain, brain if you will, is just a, a central processing unit. It can't, just, it can't sense anything. It can't do any data collection such that it would be capable of having a thought or a reaction. All it's doing is waiting for all of the work to be done in, in information gathering from the peripheral nervous system of your gut and skin, your eyes, etc., your nervous system to feed back to that gray matter so that that can then be data processed and then some sort of cohesive information passed back out. But even with the cohesive message from the brain out to the periphery, nothing would happen if the peripheral nervous system didn't have, know how to interact with that greater environment around it. Do you think it's um, it's true? We had a, a guest, Dr. Richard Massey, he's a former uh, medical anesthesiologist, and now he's just practicing primarily on on uh, natural healthcare and things, um, working with people. And he was saying on our show that one of the things that he's come across in different uh, conferences and things like that he's attended over the years is this idea that um, we've lost seventy percent of our microbiome. And I think he was saying something about like we should have over a thousand different organisms, not total. Um, amounts of organisms, but to, uh, a thousand different types of organisms, and now we're down to like three or four hundred. Um, is that true? Do you think? And it seems like it's true, but I mean, how do you know that? I wonder. Yeah, those numbers are in high hot debate because um, a lot of numbers are quite a bit higher than that as to what our ideal is. Um, the NIH and the gut, Human Gut Project there, um, we've already identified ten thousand or twelve thousand strains of different bacteria. Yeah, by species that uh, inhabit the human gut. And that's with a relatively few. Uh, I was like, you know, the first 100 patients already yielded 10,000 different species. So, you know, it, it didn't take long to find out just the, the sheer diversity capacity of the human gut. But those are American guts. And in Jeff Leach's project, which is happening now over in Africa, as we start to decode the, the microbiome of hunter-gatherers over in, in West Africa, we realize we probably are just scratching the surface of uh, the real potential for, for microbial diversity. And we started to narrow that microbial diversity in our guts the moment we started, you know, 
industrialized civilization and distancing ourselves from the microbiome as a whole. In the same way, I think that that's our, our pathway out of this disaster is getting, re-engaging nature with the expectation and now you know, proven knowledge that when you get back out into these environments and spend much more time outdoors, your microbiome shifts very quickly to uh, embrace the, that species diversification that Mother Nature is capable of delivering. And so it's both our pathway into the trouble and our pathway out. Do you think it's an issue with glyphosate being ubiquitous um, that, you know, to spend time outdoors and to spend time putting your feet in the soil? Um, I guess there's hot debate about whether or not grounding and electrification and dirty electricity and the stray voltage going back to the power plants is, is an issue. But aside from that, do you think it's an issue with glyphosate being in the soils and us being outside reconnected to soil? Sometimes I think... Even if we are getting some glyphosate from the environment, it's still beneficial. I mean, I just have to side with nature, even though we've corrupted it. Uh, don't you think? I'm 100% in line with that. I think that nature is so much more powerful than our own idiocy. I think that uh, nature has proven itself to be more powerful than our most potent toxins. Chernobyl is a good example of this. Chernobyl uh, is arguably the most you know, toxic radioactive place on the planet. Um, that accident, you know, happening, you know, 30 some years ago now, um, that massive n- natural disaster that, or, or man-made disaster that happened um, on the natural world there uh, has had some interesting opposite impact. And so while humans experienced the highest rates of thyroid cancer in history with that I- event and, you know, had to move out of the area uh, due to the level of chronic disease caused by that radiation, when you take a Geiger counter through Chernobyl today, it remains an extraordinarily toxic space. And yet, over these 30 years, the voles that live within that radioactive soil of Chernobyl have been thriving. There's been no detected birth defects or rising cancer rates. But if you take a Geiger counter and hold it up to one of those voles, they're radioactive because they live and eat in, in radioactive soils. Their prey and their predator is the wolf, the Arctic wolf there in, in Siberia. And the Siberian wolf there has got a main staple of radioactive voles. And so those animals have become radioactive. But again, instead of seeing birth defects and cancer, we see the pup size, uh, and the size of those um, pup litters increasing in those Arctic wolves. And in fact, nature as a whole has come rushing back into that vacuum of life in Chernobyl and we see, you know, endangered species thriving better there than in other parts of, of Russia and the former USSR. So it's just a fascinating, you know, story of getting outside, always the right answer. Getting as <laughs> close to nature as possible, profoundly good answer. Uh, how is it possible that those animals are surviving in that high of a radioactive environment? Probably the microbiome, again, is the answer. We now know that there's many strains of Pseudomonas uh, species bacteria that are expert at digesting things like radioactive uranium and plutonium. Uh, and so it's, it's really intriguing that the microbiome has long developed niche species to deal with every toxin on the planet. Remember, this planet was, you know, devised by whatever intelligence of, of nature was behind it with the entire periodic chart there. And so that everything from arsenic to, to the radioactive compounds these apparent toxins have their role in biology. We need those elements within the bio- biology of the planet for it to, to thrive as it does. Mm-hmm. And in the same way that biology has figured out you know, antidotes to those toxins, and so there's bacteria that can uh, transmute and, and you know, detox those pathways for us. If we isolate and we, we live in isolated homes and drywall boxes that have weird uh, in very narrow microbiome exposures, and then we get into off-gassing plastic cars, drive in an air-conditioned or heated space to uh, a carpet with an off-gassing uh, office building with our cubicles and pound all day on plastic keyboards and look at you know blue light on our monitors until we go blind, mm-hmm. and then we drive back and do the same thing tomorrow. There, there's just no health in that. We can biohack all day long, mm-hmm. and that environment is, is unbreachable. But nature has so many avenues to supporting health. And so I would always say nature is going to win. And I would always get out and touch the earth. I would be much more confident in her healing powers than the toxicity that we might create. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. Gosh, we have, I have so much that I could go with you on so many different directions, but I want to be cognizant of your time because I know you're a super busy guy um, and we wanted to keep this at about an hour. So I apologize if you ask a question on YouTube. Um, I want to be aware of Dr. Bush's time and make sure he gets out in time. But uh, one final thing, Doc, um, what can where can people find you and what upcoming projects do you have? And I know you got some products on your site as well. Like I know a lot of your work has to do with the microbiome and restoring gut motility and gut function. Function. Um, so while you're s- saying that, I'm going to show um, listeners who are watching on YouTube and Facebook your website. But where can people find you, either work with you or get closer to the work you're doing? Yeah, that Zach Bush MD website can definitely get you uh, kind of a portal into the rest of my brain there. I've got some video content, just kind of short 10 minute clips uh, at the bottom of that website as you scroll down that kind of dive into a lot of my areas of interest, um, everything from spirituality to autism, gut health and pregnancy there. So those kinds of spaces is a little bit of content. um, But then up top, you can click through to a lot of the more in-depth podcasts around the areas. Um, You can also go uh, into the shop page there and find a lot of our work and science around the microbiome and how it's providing a new foundation for health in the face of these toxins. Uh, we we stumbled upon the antidote to Roundup in our science, and so the, the bottles you see there with the Ion Gut Health product are are how we deliver the carbon cycle and the intelligence of the microbiome back into the human gut and nervous system and beyond. We have products for your kids, for pets. We have sinus product there that's been a, a, a gangbuster um, for the world. So uh, a lot there to be had. You can if you scroll down a little further, you'll see the microscopy showing the reversal of the damage from Roundup. And so you're looking at the small intestine here under a microscope, and the green is highlighting the tight junctions that are the Velcro between the cells. Uh Uh, Top left, you've got a a control membrane at at a healthy state. Straight down from that, you have glyphosate damage. And so once exposed to glyphosate, the cells unzipper from one another and become free floating, and now you have a profound leaky gut. Uh If you put the ion product back on there, uh, it zippers itself back together in uh, the same way. If you pre-treat the gut uh, with that uh, that supplement, uh, then you'll see uh, the prevention of that uh, from happening. And the interesting thing that I love about the science is the product itself is not doing the repair or the the prevention. It's actually the human cells themselves getting enough information from the product. So the product is a communication network from the microbiome. And with that wireless communication network restored, you actually see the human cell doing its resilience. You see the human cell doing the same profound capacity for injury repair and prevention that we just described in the Chernobyl setting for for these animals. When we touch the soil, which is where we derive these molecules from, uh, we get some pretty profound biology happening. And so it's a very cool message that, in fact, there's such a thing as the intrinsic health of the human being, and we have the capacity to heal. Along those same lines, another product um, that we have is my clinic, uh, the mclinic.com. The M Clinic is where I do a lot of my patient care, and we've developed you know a robust team there of integrated practitioners doing radical things. And we saw the need to expand that out past the walls of our clinic. And so I've started an eight-week series called the Intrinsic Health Series that takes you through eight weeks of one-on-one coaching with one of our intrinsic health coaches, and eight, eight hours of content from me that takes you through the fundamental base camp of how biology works in our new understanding. Uh, everything from the new understanding of the microbiome to the new understanding of water, new understandings of fasting patterns, new understandings of nutrition itself. And so these paradigm shifting kind of basics that we f- see fundamental to the future of our species, uh, we really impart during this eight week series. And the, that eight week series is a fun way for us to engage with the world and really create radical, uh, you know, transformative uh, partnerships in the community. Everybody who's gone through that intrinsic health series ends up being these natives of change in their communities. They, uh, you know, stomp out into the world with these, you know, equipped with a huge amount of truth and a huge amount of uh, solution-based plans on how to how to reinvent, you know, lifestyles that would get us in touch with our full potential again. That's really cool. And so you, it looks like you have some programs. I didn't even know you had this clinic. So this is cool. So you have programs for people that, um, as an end user and then for people that looks like they want to do some sort of health coaching or something like that to help more people. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. We do have uh, our intrinsic health series coaching uh, program. And so 
Um, we're, right now we're uh, full, uh, but we continue to take names. And as the program continues to grow, we keep enlisting more and more coaches. And so we've got about 50 coaches right now and climbing. So uh, it's an exciting era where all of us can get engaged for this kind of revolution at that base level. Beyond all of that, we're recognizing that these carbon cycles are critical to all of nature. And we would love to see the opportunity to put our our supplement companies out of business by correcting the, the big agricultural scene, eliminating toxins altogether from the planet. And so we started a nonprofit this past year uh, called Farmers Footprint. Uh, you can see that at farmersfootprint.us. And we are uh, now engaging farmers all over the world uh, to create regenerative farming uh, on a grand scale to really supplant chemical farming as a whole uh, with the hope that once we regenerate nature uh, through our, our elimination of these toxin pathways, uh, you're going to get to see a, a radical new foundation for your health for your children and grandchildren in the future. So we would love to see you support our nonprofit there. These farmers are desperate for your help. Uh, we've never seen a higher rate of suicide in farmers as we see today. Mm -hmm. um, they, we're losing 6,000 to 8,000 farmers, uh, 6,000 to 8,000 farms a year now in the United States that are going out of business. And so uh, farming's in free fall, um, and you know, it's largely foreign entities and chemical companies and VCs that are buying up the land instead of future farmers. And so we we're really trying to reverse that trend back towards a true food security pathway for our nation and for the world at large. That is super cool. I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. I'm looking at some of your Ion Gut Health. So you got kids. So we should get our kids on this because we have a year and a half twin boys. Um, so this would be something that we could presumably, do you think, give to our kids at that young of an age? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we start off in, um, so breastfeeding moms will just uh, put a few drops on the, on the nipple before breastfeeding. Turns out that glyphosate shows up in quite high doses, 1,700 times more than it is in water can be found in, in breast milk. Um, and so uh, it's important to protect those infants. And so we just put a few drops on the nipple before each breastfeeding. And then as they be, start to eat food, you can put the kids' products straight into applesauce or other food uh, products uh, as they become uh, oral there. Gosh, that's so cool because I, I love that, you know, there are major problems in our world today, massive problems that people just aren't, people are just, I guess, are singular focused on their work and doing their career and their, their own life problems. But there's these massive global issues going on today. Uh, but the cool thing is there's solutions everywhere. There's solutions and, um, it's my contention that if you keep searching and keep looking, you'll come across solutions, right? Always. Mother Nature's got them. She never misses. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Doc, well, thank you so much for your time. I know we had to reschedule a few times, and I appreciate you uh, being flexible with our tech issues. So I, I appreciate that and, and your work, too. So everything is at ZachBushMD.com. And do you have links to all those other websites as well on your main website? Yeah, you'll find it there. You can also find me on Instagram uh, and Facebook, and uh, we direct a lot back to Farms for Print and a lot of the products that are ongoing there through that pathway. So cool. Zach Bush MD on, on Instagram and Facebook as well. Ah, cool, Doc. Well, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it, and uh, keep up the good work. And if you ever come across any new discoveries, any new product, uh, products or projects, anything like that, let me know, and we'll, we'll do it again. Thanks so much. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, everybody in the audience, for listening. All right. Thanks so much, Doc. I will, uh, I'll talk to you soon. I'll send your team our, our link to today's show. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye. So there you go, guys. I have something that I wanted to share with you about the microbiome. I didn't get a chance to say, uh, say it during the show, but, um, I'm curious your thoughts. So we're going to do a little break and I can hang out for a couple minutes. Um, I don't have to be home for a little bit, so I can hang out for five or 10 minutes after the show. Uh, we're going to do a little break right now and I got some things to share when it comes to the microbiome, our gut, and also this weird thing that I heard, and I'll tell you where I heard it, but it has to do with cancer and disease and composting. All right. So I'll, I'll share that <laughs> in just a second, but, um, I want to take a quick little break and I wanted to share with you, um, some of the products that we talk about for our little puppy doggies. And many of you guys know that we have two little pups, um, Charlie and Coco, and they absolutely love this barf world raw dog food. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, the benefits of feeding your dogs uh, a 
a diet that's not just muscle meat. So muscle meat is very acidic and it's it's very um, localized. And if a dog in the wild were to hunt something, they wouldn't just eat the muscle meat. They would eat what they call nose to tail. Uh, and so this is what Barf World is. It's a combination of muscle meat, organ meat, and bone. And this is what a dog would eat in the wild um, if they caught some prey, for example. And listen to Dr. – or not not Dr. Robert Mueller, the founder of Barf World, talk about um, this diet. Did you know that conventional dog food contains antibiotics, herbicides, pesticides, ground up carcasses from roadkill subjected to high heat processing, artificial colors, chemical preservatives, way too many carbohydrates, genetically modified corn syrups, indigestible grains, and a lack of moisture content in the dry kibble? Obviously, this can lead to health conditions like diabetes, itchy skin, teeth and gum problems, liver damage, obesity, behavioral issues, pancreatic problems, and even cancer. That's why we recommend the BARF diet, which is the biologically appropriate raw food diet from BARF World. Their unprocessed raw meats contain bone, organ meats, vitamins, and minerals that are loaded with enzymes. BARF World founder Robert Mueller explains more. Sure, I don't have to convince you on the damage that's caused by high heat to food. So as a result, we see many skin disorders, a lot of arthritis, obesity, heart disease, cancers. I mean, it's just rampant. The pet clinics are just all of these conditions and basically a large percentage of the commercial pet food that's made is made up of the human industry leftovers and the pet food industry makes use of this waste product and in addition to that we are subjected to the products coming out of the rendering plants garbage in garbage out if you feed garbage your dog, you're going to end up with garbage health. And you know, if you put the right gas in, your engine runs smoother and lasts longer. So if you put the right fuel in the tank, you're going to get the right output. Garbage in, garbage out. We've seen an immense difference with our dog Maggie being on this diet. Give your dog the gift of health today by going to extremehealthradio.com forward slash barf or go to our store. That's extremehealthradio.com slash barf to learn even more. Yeah, so our store is newly updated and it's now changed to biocharge.me. So if you want, guys want to check out this product, um, if you're listening on the go, kind of, and you're out doing your exercises, whatever you're doing, uh, this is episode 644. So we'll put links to this product, uh, as long with all the other ones at extremehealthradio.com forward slash 644. Um, and I highly recommend if you love your little pets, your little dogs, and you want to see what they would be like on a raw food diet, raw whole food diet, um, I, I highly recommend this stuff. And this is what we feed our dogs, Charlie and Coco, and they just love it. They just absolutely love it. They thrive on it. Um, it's just a great, great thing to give to your little four-legged critters. <laughs> and here's one other product I want to tell you guys about, something that has changed my life and something that I love doing every single day. It's uh, Qigong. Uh, Qigong is an ancient practice. It's an ancient uh, martial art that's been used for over 4,000 years in the Orient. And it's a way of like grounding yourself to the earth and reconnecting your energy and not losing and leaking life force energy. It's just a, an amazing practice. And what's cool <laughs> excuse me about this is that um, all it requires is 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the evening and it's a digital course and you get access to um, learning how these ancient movements like a moving meditation can actually uh, benefit you in so many ways and um, it's a great practice to do for longevity and uh, and healing too check out what uh, Christopher Shade had to say about this people come to me and they're really sick and they got this blown out n neurological system and all this toxicity and I tell them you need to do Qigong, Tai Chi. You need to do these things that settle down and restore your neurology because it puts together all the parts. It puts you back into that state where you can start to detoxify. Mm -hmm. And so I highly, highly recommend all that. Yeah, that was Dr. Christopher Shade, and he has um, Quicksilver Scientific, I think, and uh, just an amazing guy. And listen to what uh, Kit Campbell had to say about Qigong as well. Mm -hmm. Qigong is amazing and the reason that I believe it to be amazing is everything here is energy that is a scientific fact if there ever is one so mm -hmm. when you're practicing qigong you're actually drawing energy into your body your intention whatever your intention is behind any action will determine the level of energy type of energy that you absorb into your body 
So your intention behind <laughs> your is very important, just like thought. So when you're practicing Qigong, you're actually bringing energy in and you're bringing out the stuff that might be a bit stale. With Tai Chi, it's totally different. The energy runs underneath the skin because it's a, it's more of a, a martial, this is the Chinese understanding, by the way. It's more of a martial art. So Qigong is very, very good for bringing that energy into the body and just fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's really cool. I don't know if you guys are familiar with or practice on any regular basis, regular sitting meditation. And I think uh, Qigong is not a replacement for that. And that's not a replacement for Qigong. But it's more like a moving meditation and, and working with energy. And there's something really different about it. Like when you start doing the movements and the practice and you close your eyes and you breathe, um, you know, ideally, it would be a good you know, to do it in the morning sun to get the UVA, UVB, and UVC rays of the sun while you're grounded, connected to the earth, doing this ancient practice. Like, there's something just really different about it. It's just different than doing a sitting meditation. I think they both have their place, but uh, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening, if you're looking to overcome any kind of health challenge, if you're looking to get healthier, this is such a good practice because. There was a study saying recently that um, there is more, someone goes through more stress today than they did 100 years ago in their whole life. In one day, there's so much stress in today's culture, in today's society. And if you can find and carve out like 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening, this is a really great self-care practice. And um, I, I just can't recommend it enough. It's, it's, it's changed my life. It's an amazing, amazing product. And it's a digital course. And you get access to it immediately and you can start practicing right away. Uh, it's just a great, great product. And uh, that's why it's in our store. That's, that's what we do is we, we put in our store all the great products that we love and, uh, and make them available to you. So those are available at biocharge.me. And I'm going to share some things about the microbiome right after this. This is Extreme Health Radio, where we're 100% listener supported. Make sure to join the Extreme Health Academy with thousands of other listeners and get real solutions for your health challenges. Yeah, so we have right now, I think, 21 full-blown courses inside the Academy, um, and we're releasing a new course every single month. And I'm telling you guys, it's one of the most transformational places, because not only do you get the community, and do you get people to be friends with you and help you on your health journey, but you also get this amazing instruction. And we're going to be bringing in practitioners. Like I have amazing access to some of the most cutting-edge people in the whole world, and we're going to be bringing them into the Academy as well here pretty soon. We're doing some workshops with people just taking your health to brand new levels it's what it's all about and we don't get sort of we don't get taught this in our school and it's really unfortunate um not that it's the school's place to teach us about health but it's just very bizarre how we start our life and we have no idea how to take care of this human frame yet we are perplexed when we get completely sick and we're perplexed when things go bad and we don't know why these things are happening. And so that's why it's really important to understand how the body works and how to work with nature so that uh, we can exude abundant health, which should be a byproduct of our lifestyle and environment. And then we can take that energy and go do great things in the world. Uh, and that's what Extreme Health Academy is all about. So I'm in the forums every single day, uh, sharing what knowledge I've been able to accumulate over the years since 2003, helping people as much as I possibly can. Um, and it's just a great, great place. So if you want a free two-week trial to the Academy, just go to ExtremeHealthAcademy.com and enter the code EHR14 and you'll get a free two-week trial. And come say hello in the forums. I would love to help you and work with you in any way I possibly can. It's, a, it's, it's the full extension of what we do here in the radio show. So it's a, it's a great community, great place with thousands of other people to, uh, to join and have fun and communicate with each other. Um, and so I'm just honored to be a part of that. I'm honored that you guys chose us to be a part of your healing journey. And uh, it's just it's just great. So um, one of the things I wanted to share with you guys about the microbiome is that we had a guest. So this is kind of like the, I don't know, it, 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 I guess it's the benefit of, for me, doing 650 shows is I'm able to sort of bring together, um, you know, all of the shows that we've done along with all the podcasts that I listen to and things like that. They, I just consume a lot of information, so I'm able to sort of aggregate that. And so we had a guest on... 
Oh, gosh, what was her name? Hannah Crum, and she is the kombucha, what does she call herself? Kombucha Mama, I think. And <laughs> we purchased some scobies and some stuff from her back in the day. Uh, really great website. Um, Hannah Crum, H-A-N-N-A-H, I think, C-R-U-M. Kombucha Mama, maybe? Anyway, we had her on the show probably in t- 2013, and we were talking about this idea of the microbiome and kombucha and bacteria and things, and it was really interesting. It's something that sticks with you. And she was sharing this story about how she now thinks that, like, you know how if you're standing in the kitchen doing your dishes and you're just sort of hanging out there, you're by yourself, and uh, or at least you think you're by yourself and you're all alone, you're doing the dishes, you're kind of zoning out in your mind, right? And then your significant other comes home and you don't hear them. And then they, and then they're walking up to you, but somehow you have this weird, bizarre feeling. It's that gut feeling, right? That someone else is in the room with you. It's really weird, isn't it? Like when that happens, you're just like, it's just bizarre. Like you don't, you have this feeling in your gut, like someone else is staring at me or someone's staring at the back of my head or someone else is in this room. Um, and she, has been at that time looking at some studies and, and starting to think this as well that it's the gut microbiome in her gut communicating with the gut microbiome in my gut that's communicating back and forth and that's how I know someone is behind me now don't you think that's so crazy wouldn't that be crazy if that were true like if that were true that would just be amazing it would just be so because that would mean that First of all, they're aware of each other's existence, which is by itself bizarre, right? So you have this, these bacteria that are essentially isolated from each other in two different living in two different bodies, essentially isolated from each other. But somehow when they get closer to each other, they have this awareness of time and space. And not only do they have this awareness, but they have this ability to communicate to each other. And how they're doing that, we don't even know yet. And after the show that we did with Amy Prohl, it's kind of making sense to me now that there's these electrical energy fields that we exude um, outside of our body. And maybe these bacteria through microscopic, invisible um, matrix-like cellular approach to each other can actually use this to sort of hijack and communicate to each other. It's amazing. What's what, If that is possible, it just opens the doors up to so many other aspects and realms that sort of dance between the physical and the spiritual, the physical and the emotional, and this weird dance between them both that kind of bridges these two things together. So that gut feeling perhaps is your microbiome communicating with the microbiome of another person. Or, or how weird would this be? This would be really weird. What if the microbiome of someone who's passed away, this is kind of creepy, but it just occurred to me right now. What if the microbiome of someone who passed away still is on the earth or still somehow lives externally from their bodies on the earth and is able to communicate with your microbiome? Wouldn't that be weird? That would be so weird. Who knows? I don't even think there's any way we can... We can actually, um, I don't think there'd be a way for us to actually ever be able to measure or manage or to figure out if that's true. I don't think scientific studies will ever go there, but man, what, wouldn't that be weird? These like senses of ghosts or, or communicating with past lives or talking to deceased relatives. You know, I wonder if, if that's all done through the mycelial connection through bacteria and fungus, um, via the microbiome and these bacteria that sort of live everywhere on the earth. I wonder if we're all just involved in one sort of giant field that um, that's bigger than we are and that controls everything within us. Like crazy, right? That's a weird thought. Um, after I'm going to check out what you guys are saying on the YouTube uh, feed here in just a sec. But um, something else that I thought was really interesting was um, there was a podcast I listened to with a former guest of ours, Meridian Grace. M-E-R-I-D-I-A-N, Meridian Grace, and she's at AwakeningHealth.com. And I, I don't know the podcast, and I don't know when it was. I listen to so much information always to try to learn different facets about health. And um, and she was saying that, and I tried looking this up, but I couldn't find it anywhere. But she was saying that there are some, some people doing some unique healing of diseases. And what she was saying was cancers. And what they were doing, the protocol involved 
building a compost pile. And I don't know if it was a compost pile or if it was necess- or maybe a hole in the ground that was filled. Kind of like, you know how when you go to the beach as a child and you, f- and you, and you basically bury yourself except for your head in, in sand. It's that idea with composting. And these organisms that are living and able to be in your skin and able to um, enter your body through your skin, actually helping people to heal from diseases like cancer. And so that's something I've only heard one person say, and that was Meridian Grace. And that was, um, I'd never heard that before. And I'd like to get her insights on that, where she heard that from, because I looked it up and I couldn't find anything online about it. But she's also a researcher and she studies stuff and she's exposed to all this kind of information on a regular basis. And so this is the kind of thing where like when we talk in the forums inside the academy, like there's unique perspectives that we share as a group, as a community and different angles and facets of health. Like maybe you never thought about oral pathology and the role that our, our teeth play in our health and it's it's you know close to the top of the list when it comes to overcoming a health challenge is getting your mouth corrected by a biological dentist who knows what they're doing um you know we go to a guy named dr Stuart nunley um i I can't recommend him enough but he's in marble falls texas and he has uh, healthy smiles for life.com and you know, your oral pathology is at the almost at the top of the list when it comes to making sure this tremendous burden can be lifted off your immune system. And so it's so critical to make sure that you get rid of your mercury fillings, you get rid of your cavitations, you get rid of your root canals. Like these are really, really foundational um, aspects of making sure you don't have this constant burden on your immune system through oral pathology, oral issues. And so, you know, these are kind of ideas that we discuss in the academy. Um, maybe things you've never talked about, light water magnetism, spiritual growth, all kinds of different aspects of how we're on the cutting edge of different healing modalities in today's world. So, um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions, I can hang out for a couple more minutes here before I'm going to go back home. I hope you guys are enjoying the show. Looks like a lot of cool people. Ah, Kate, you're in this. That's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. So I'll hang out here for one or two more minutes um, if you guys have any questions. Angie is here, Big Fat Mama. Great to have you here. 360 Space Monkey, Julia is here. Rebecca or Beck from the forums is here. Chris, this is great. Chris says... Kate, I miss you on the show. Yeah, we miss having Kate on the show as well. Kate, we got to fix that one of these days, right? We got to get you back on. It's all about how do we get someone to watch the twins while <laughs> while Kate does shows with us. But yeah. Um, cool, guys. Wow, you guys are... Bob Dylan says, love me some barf. Yeah, it doesn't sound too good, does it? It's not really like a good business name feed your dog the barf diet but i think it stands for biologically appropriate raw food diet but it just sounds pretty gross right (laughs) uh nikki great to have you here yeah great to have you guys here this is really cool megan julia gosh the chat is just going crazy you guys are awesome um do you guys have any questions about any of the, the you know the show what we talked about anything to do with the academy or any of the products on biocharge.me let me know um, Kate says happy or Chris says happy birthday Justin I appreciate it thank you 44 I didn't even realize it was my birthday today until after I woke up and then I, I realized I totally forgot it was my birthday so <laughs> 360 space monkey Kate looks hot <laughs> yep that's for sure you know I can get his email address though um, Kenneth cool cool guys Ancient Chinese energetic meridians in the mouth governs organs in the body, says Dordi 99. Yeah, so w- what's interesting, I think, about 
I feel like I have a unique take when it comes to this kind of stuff because there's a lot of people that focus on certain things. Like there's people that focus on oral pathology and dental health. There's a lot of people that focus on light. There's a lot of people that focus on minerals like uh, Morley Robbins and the balance between iron, copper, magnesium, which I've been into lately. There's a lot of people that focus on glyphosate, so, you know, different aspects of health. But it's it's how do we put it all together and how do we how do we change the things in our life to build an environment that supports our health. And that's really what it's all about because there's active and passive things that you can do. And I always encourage people to start with the passive things that you can do to change and alter your environment externally so that your internal environment can change as a result of the external change. And so that means passive changes that you can do to things that you already do to improve your health. And that means manipulating and changing the environment you live in or in the environment you work in that supports and promotes health. Because those things are the place to start first. Because it's really challenging to change your health when it comes to like overcoming a food addiction or overcoming trying to change your diet or trying to change these lifelong patterns that we've been living with and giving into our whole life. It's really challenging to do that. And so I like to change the environment in a passive way first. Build an environment that supports your health and then start working on things that you can actually do actively that requires a little bit of discipline. Like today after the show, I'm going to go work out. I'm going to, you know, and so it requires a little bit of discipline to eat right, you know, requires a little bit of discipline. It requires active things that you have to do. But those are, you know, it's hard to do those when your environment sucks and your environment doesn't support health. Um, so change your environment first and then start working on the things that you have to do actively that requires discipline and things like that because that's the hardest place to start with. And unfortunately, that's where most people start with with their health is, that, is they start focusing on the things that are the hardest to change. And those things don't even move the needle as much as passive things. So I'm convinced it's our environment that dictates our health. And you change the environment. Like a, if a sick, if a fish is sick, you don't look at the food. You look at the water it's swimming in, right? So it's it's the water that a fish swims in that ultimately determines how its physiology reacts to the environment and how vibrant and and healthy and robust that fish is. So the same thing happens with our health. Let's focus on building a better home environment, a better work environment, uh, lowering stress, making ATP, creating energy in the cell. That's what it's really all about. And creating an environment that supports that, then you can start working on these harder, more difficult things like working out, getting in the sun, blocking blue light, uh, making sure you're eating correctly, you know, going to bed on time, and all these other things that are kind of challenging to do. And so that's where I like to start. And so uh, that's that's kind of what I, I like to focus on first. And so in the academy, it's like we're putting all these pieces together. Uh, and that's what I love. And it's really fun for me to interact with you guys in the academy because, like, it's cool. It's cool to be able to help you specifically with different situations going on. And uh, unfortunately, there's some massive changes coming to YouTube. Um, there's rumblings about December 10th. And platforms being um, not just demonetized, but platforms being taken off altogether. And so we're moving everything over to the academy. And so this is the direction we're going to a private community because it's hard, man. Like being in the public and you have different entities that are scrutinizing and critiquing the things that you say. You can't use the C word. You can't do this or that. So it's really important to create a private place where we can hang out with each other and help each other and say what we want to say in a private environment. And that's why we're moving ultimately to the Academy. So hopefully we still have our YouTube. We still have our Instagram and Facebook, but there's no guarantees. Um, but we will have the Academy. So I'm really, really stoked to have that at least. Um, so Nikki says affirmations spoken with pure focus are a powerful tool. That's so true. The only live chat I connect where like, we're like a telepathically connected family. <laughs> 360 Space Monkey. I know, it's weird, huh? It's like we're all connected together. And that's that's one of the weird things. It's like this this weird, bizarre world we have where people are becoming more and more disconnected, but more connected in a weird way because um, 
we have technology, but it's a fake connection. It's not really like the same as standing and hugging someone. It's just not the same, but it's better than nothing. And so this is why we're doing the Academy and this is why we do what we do to help as many people get connected and stuff. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that show and stay tuned. We're going to have more shows coming up on this coming up Friday and we'll do some shows. Let me read to you our little schedule and see who we have coming up so you can take a look at who we have. So let's take a look here. Glenn Swartout this Friday on Accelerated Self-Healing. Uh, Dr. Jacob Lieberman on Monday, one week, interview light, color, and consciousness. Callie Lyons, we're going to be talking about PFA, PFAS, highly fluorinated chemicals or forever chemicals. And Dr. Michelle Lamasa Schrader, she was in our, in our studio a little while ago. She's really cool. Oh, Stephen here is going to be coming in. Cool. Uplifting, life-giving way, uh, nutrient-dense, Never been damaged by heat. Uh, Adam Bergstrom is coming up. Cool, 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 cool. So we got a lot of cool shows. So if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, make sure to subscribe. Or if you're listening on iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Uh, leave us a review as well. That would be super helpful. Um, you know that a lot of you guys don't realize that the more reviews uh, a podcast has or a radio show has on iTunes, um, the more it shows up when people search. So it's really important to us if you. Um, leave us a good review. And if you want to join and go deeper with your health and get the tools, the inspiration, the education to overcome your health challenges, join us in the Extreme Health Academy. It's uh, extremehealthacademy.com, EHR14. We'll give you a two-week trial. If you're watching on YouTube, sh there should be links down below for that and the coupon code as well. If you're watching on Facebook, make sure to go to this show page, which is extremehealthradio.com slash 644 yeah awesome all right guys well i think i'm done i'm gonna go home and uh kate i'll be home in just a second uh i gotta transfer the files and all that good stuff so um bob dylan thanks for the show you're welcome happy 44th justin thank you i appreciate that uh <laughs> i appreciate you guys so much you guys are awesome i really mean that megan doreen bob dylan uh nikki you guys are cool man thank you for uh for being here and joining us, spending some time with us today. And hopefully um, you got some good good content out of that show and some ideas that might change how you look at your health and, um, and all that good stuff. So uh, really appreciate you guys being a part of everything that we have going on. And um, stay tuned for next Friday. We'll be back at 1045 a.m. Pacific. Come join us in the Academy. I'd love to help you out personally with anything I possibly can. Um, and love you all. Thank you. And to get all the notes for this show, it's extremehealthradio.com slash 644. I'm going to go home and have some lunch, do a little workout, and enjoy the babies. Um, all right, guys. <laughs> love you all. See you hopefully in the Extreme Health Academy. Take care. No material on this blog is intended to suggest that you should not seek professional medical care. Always work with qualified medical professionals, even if you educate yourself in the field of live food, nutrition, and alternative medicine. I'm not a doctor, nor am I offering readers medical advice of any kind. None of the information offered here should be interpreted as a diagnosis of any disease, nor an attempt to treat or prevent any disease or condition. While information in this blog is discussed in the context of numerous conditions, it can be dangerous to take action based on any information in this blog or to start any health program without first consulting a health professional. The content found here is for informational purposes only and is in no way intended as medical advice, as a substitute for medical counseling, or as a treatment slash cure for any disease or health condition, and nor should it be continued as such. Always work with a qualified healthcare professional before making any changes to your diet, prescription drug use, lifestyle, or exercise activities. This information is provided as is, and the reader slash viewer assumes all risks from the use, non-use, or misuse of this information.